The Society of the Spectacle by Guy Debord. Chapter 2. The Commodity as Spectacle. The commodity can be understood in its undistorted essence only when it becomes the universal category of society as a whole. Only in this context does the reification produced by commodity relations assume decisive importance both for the objective evolution of society and for the attitudes that people adopt toward it as it subjugates their consciousness to the forms in which this reification finds expression as labor is increasingly rationalized and mechanized, this subjugation is reinforced by the fact that people's activity becomes less and less active and more and more contemplative. That was a quote from George Lucas, History and Class Consciousness. 35. In the spectacle's basic practice of incorporating into itself all the fluid aspects of human activity, so as, to, so as to possess them in a congealed form and of inverting living values into purely abstract values, we recognize our old enemy, the commodity, which seems at first glance so trivial and obvious, yet which is actually so complex and full of metaphysical subtleties. 36. The fetishism of the commodity the domination of society by imperceptible as well as perceptible things attains its ultimate fulfillment in the spectacle where the perceptible world is replaced by a selection of images which is projected above it yet which at the same time succeeds in making itself regarded as the perceptible par excellence 37 the world at once present and absent that the spectacle holds up to view is the world of the commodity dominating all living experience. The world of the commodity is thus shown for what it is, because its development is identical to people's arrangement from each other, or estrangement from each other, and from everything they produce. 38. The loss of quality that is so evident at every level of spectacular language from the objects it glorifies to the behavior it regulates, stems from the basic nature of a production system that shuns reality. The commodity form reduces everything to quantitative equivalents. The quantitative is what it develops, and it can develop only within the quantitative. 39. Despite the fact that this development excludes the qualitative, it is itself subject to qualitative change. The spectacle reflects the fact that this development has crossed the threshold of its own abundance. Although this qualitative change has so far taken place only partially in a few local areas, it is already implicit at the universal level that was the commodity's original standard, a standard that the commodity has lived up to by turning the whole planet into a single world market. 40. The development of productive forces has been the unconscious history that has actually created and altered the living condition of human groups, the conditions enabling them to survive and the expansion of those conditions. It has been the economic basis of all human undertakings. Within natural economies, the emergence of a commodity sector represented a surplus survival. Commodity production, which implies the exchange of varied products between independent producers tended for a long time to retain its small-scale craft aspects, relegated as it was to a marginal economic role where its quantitative reality was still hidden. But wherever it encountered the social conditions of large-scale commerce and capital accumulation, it took total control of the economy. The entire economy then transformed human labor itself into a commodity, into wage labor, and ultimately produced a level of, ab of abundance sufficient to solve the initial problem of survival. But only in such a way that the same problem is continually regenerated at a higher level. Economic growth has liberated societies from the natural pressures that force them into an immediate struggle for survival, but they have not yet been liberated from their liberator. The commodity's independence has spread to the entire economy. It now dominates. This economy has transformed the world, but it has merely transformed it into a world dominated by the economy. The pseudo-nature within which human labor has become alienated demands that such labor 
remain forever in its service. And since this demand is formulated by and answerable only to itself, it in fact ends up channeling all socially permitted projects and endeavors into its own reinforcement. The abundance of commodities, that is, the abundance of commodity relations, amounts to nothing more than an augmented survival. 41. As long as the economy's role as material basis of social life was neither noticed nor understood, remaining unknown precisely because it was so familiar, the commodity's dominion over the economy was exerted in a covert manner. In societies where actual commodities were few and far between, money was the apparent master, serving as plenipotentiary representative of the greater power that remained unknown. With the Industrial Revolution's manufactural division of labor and mass production for a global market, the commodity finally became fully visible as a power that was colonizing all social life. It was at that point that political economy established itself as the dominant science and as the science of domination. 42. The spectacle is the stage at which the commodity has succeeded in totally colonizing social life. Commodification is not only visible, we no longer see anything else. The world we see is the world of the commodity. Modern economic production extends its dictatorship both extensively and intensively. In the less industrialized regions, its reign is already manifested by the presence of a few star commodities and by the imperialist domination imposed by the more industrially advanced regions. In the latter, social space is blanketed with ever new layers of commodities. With the second industrial revolution, alienated consumption has become as much a duty for the masses as alienated production. The society's entire sold labor has become a total commodity whose constant turnover must be maintained at all cost. To accomplish this, this total commodity has to be returned in fragmented form to fragmented individuals who are completely cut off from the overall operation of the productive forces. To this end, the specialized science of domination is itself broken down into further specialties, such as sociology, psychotechnology, cybernetics, and semiology, which oversee the self-regulation of every phase of the process. Forty-three. Whereas during the primitive stage of capitalist accumul accumulation, political economy considers the proletarian only as a worker, we, who only needs to be allotted the indispensable minimum for maintaining his labor power, and never considers him in his leisure and humanity, this ruling class perspective is revised as soon as commodity abundance reaches the level that requires an additional collaboration from him. Once his workday is over, the worker is suddenly redeemed from the total contempt toward him that is clearly implied by every aspect of the organization and surveillance of production, and finds himself seemingly treated like a grown-up, with a great show of politeness in his new role as a consumer. At this point, the, the humanism of the commodity takes charge of the worker's leisure and humanity, simply because political economy now can and must dominate those spheres as political economy. The total denial of man has thus taken charge of all human existence. 44. The spectacle is a permanent opium war designed to force people to equate goods with commodities and to equate satisfaction with a survival that expands according to its own laws. Consumable survival must constant constantly expand because it never ceases to include privation. If augmented survival never comes to a resolution, if there is no point where it might stop expanding, this is because it is itself stuck in the realm of privation. It may give or it may gild poverty, but it cannot transcend it. 45. Automation, which is both the most advanced sector of modern industry and the epitome of its practice, obliges the commodity system to resolve the following contradiction. The technological developments that objectively tend to eliminate work must at the same time preserve labor as a commodity, because labor is the only creator of commodities. The only way to prevent automation or any other less extreme method of increasing labor productivity from reducing society's total necessary labor time is to create new jobs. 
To this end, the Reserve Army of the Unemployed is enlisted into the tertiary or service sector, reinforcing the troops responsible for distributing and glorifying the latest commodities at a time when increasingly extensive campaigns are necessary to convince people to buy increasingly unnecessary commodities. 46. Exchange value could arise only as a representative of use value, but the victory it eventually won with its own weapons created the conditions for its own autonomous power. By mobilizing all human va use value and monopolizing its fulfillment, exchange value ultimately succeeded in controlling use. Use has come to be seen purely in terms of exchange value and is now completely at its mercy. Starting out like a condottiere in the service of use value, exchange value has ended up waging the war for its own sake. 47. The constant decline of use value that has always characterized the capitalist economy has given rise to a new form of poverty within the realm of augmented survival, alongside the old poverty which still persists, since the vast majority of people are still forced to take part as wage workers in the unending pursuit of the system's ends, and each of them knows that they must submit or die. The reality of this blackmail, the fact that even in its most impoverished forms, food, shelter, use value now has no existence outside the illusory riches of augmented survival, accounts for the general acceptance of the illusions of modern commodity consumption. The real consumer has become a consumer of illusions. The commodity is this materialized illusion and spectacle is its general expression. 48. Use value was formerly understood as an implicit aspect of exchange value. Now, however, within the upside down world of the spectacle, use value must be explicitly proclaimed, both because its actual reality has been eroded by the under or by the overdeveloped commodity economy and because it serves as a necessary pseudo justification of a counterfeit life. 49. The spectacle is the flip side of money. It too is an abstract general equivalent of all commodities. But whereas money has dominated society as the representation of universal equivalence, the exchangeability of different goods whose uses remain uncomparable, the spectacle is the modern complement of money, a representation of the commodity world as a whole, which serves as a general equivalent for what the entire society can be and can do. The spectacle is the spectacle is money one can only look at because in it all use has already been exchanged for the totality of abstract representation. The spectacle is not just a servant of pseudo use. It is already in itself a pseudo use of life. 50. With the achievement of economic abundance, the concentrated result of social labor becomes visible subjecting all reality to the appearances that are now that labor's primary product. Capital is no longer the invisible center governing the production process. As it accumulates, it spreads to the ends of the earth in the form of tangible objects. The entire expanse of society is its portrait. 51. The economy's triumph as an independent power at the same time spells its own doom because the forces it has unleashed have eliminated the economic necessity that was the unchanging basis of earlier societies. Replacing that necessary or that ne replacing that necessity with a necessity for boundless economic development can only mean replacing the satisfaction of primary human needs, now scarcely met with an incessant fabrication of pseudo needs, all of which ultimately come down to the single pseudo need of maintaining the reign of the autonomous economy. But that economy loses all connection with authentic needs insofar as it emerges from the social unconscious that unknowingly depended on it. Whatever is conscious wears out. What is unconscious remains unalterable. But once it is freed, does it not fall to, to ruin in its turn? That last bit was a quote from Freud. 52. Once society discovers that it depends on the economy, the economy in fact depends on the society. When the subterranean power of the economy grew to the point of visible domination, it lost its power. The economic id must be replaced by the I. 
This subject can only arise out of society, that is, out of the struggle within society. Its existence depends on the outcome of the class struggle, that is both product and producer of the economic foundation of history. 53. Consciousness of desire and desire for consciousness are the same project, the project that in its negative form seeks the abolition of classes and thus the workers' direct possession of every aspect of their activity. The opposite of this project is the society of the spectacle, where the commodity contemplates itself in a world of its own making.